Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is Taylor Green, and I am a second year graduate student in the Communication Studies Department. I want to start by thanking those who made this night possible. Thank you to Dr. Stacy Wolbert, Dr. Tim Thompson, and Rosemary Graham, who helped plan and answer any questions I had over the past few months. Thank you also to SGA and Highmark for sponsoring this evening. I also want to thank Christopher LaFuria for all of his help in marketing this event. Without your help and support, this event would not have been possible. So again, thank you so much. When I was 14, my family lost a son, brother, nephew, cousin, grandson, and friend to suicide. His name was Matt. He was the person that never failed to put a smile on anyone's face. At just 15 years old, Matt took his life. To keep my cousin's memory alive, I have decided to write my graduate thesis on the social construction of suicide. Through my research and personal experience, I began to feel this campus and community would benefit from a discussion on mental health. So it is both an honor and a privilege to be here introducing Kevin Hines. Kevin is one of only 36 people to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge and survive. He is the only survivor who travels the world and speaks about the importance of mental health and living mentally well. There will be a Q&A as well as a meet and greet at the end of this presentation. The meet and greet will take place out where the merchandise, is, the merchandise table is. For those of you who are receiving extra credit for attending, there will be a proof of attendance slip given out at the end as you leave. The content of this presentation may be sensitive to some people. To anyone who may feel triggered, there are counselors on site to assist you at any point during this presentation. Just walk out to the back through the lobby and they can assist you there. Before we hear from Kevin, this is his trailer for his movie. That I desperately wanted to hear right before I catapulted myself over the rail. I have now lived 15 years past the day I should have died. When you see a lot of mental illness being expressed, that's a clue that the culture is sick, not the person. 
Hey, brother. Hello, Kevin. You were the first person to ever say, you know, Kevin, you should talk about this. Our guest, Kevin Hines, plummeted 200 feet but survived. Today, I travel the globe spreading a message of hope. Why? Because we know it helps people heal. There's a huge opportunity as we talk about stories of survival to support people who are out there who are in pain. I break down on a regular basis. I have symptoms every day. Um, I still have hallucinations, both auditory and visual. Families of those who jumped from the iconic structure urged to stop the suicides. One person goes to this bridge to die every seven to 10 days. I think it's our obligation to stop it. You go to Paris, go to New York, you go to Istanbul, there are suicide barriers. The more people that know about the horror of that bridge, the more pressure will be put to do something to stop it. Will this really decrease suicides, you think? They say things like, why ruin the aesthetics? What, what are the aesthetics of a bridge compared to one human life? Kevin Hines, there's no telling how many lives were saved by you because you weren't able to take your own. Let's get to that place that nobody is being brave who talks about their brain disease. They're just being honest. My name is Kevin Hines, and this is my story. Cheers. Before I begin tonight's presentation, I'm going to step back. Before I begin tonight's presentation, there's something we need to do. Right here, right now, together. We have to take a moment of silence for all of those that we have lost to suicide from pain, lethal emotional pain, something I know a great deal about. But today is not about the way they died or the day they died. Today is about how they lived before they got sick in the first place. Today is about the beauty that they were right here and forever will remain right here. And today we choose to celebrate their lives, the beauty that they will forever be, the light that exuded from within them. We celebrate their lives and we do it together because the only way to properly grieve a suicide is together without blame and with no guilt. It doesn't belong to you. They didn't die because of you or in spite of you. They died because of an epic and unrelenting amount of lethal emotional pain that you had nothing to do with. Let us celebrate their lives and do it like I do it on their birthdays with family and friends that love them just as much as you do. On their birthday, you're only allowed to recount the good times, the last warm embrace they gave you, the last smile you saw on their face, the good memories, and celebrate their lives and do it like I do it, with gluten-free cake and a candle, because that's how I roll, <laughs> OK? Celebrate their beauty and remember the good, and be ever thankful for the little time you had with them, because gratitude builds resilience and helps the rest of us find the will to stay here in the face of pain. My new friends, a moment of silence for all of those that we have lost to suicide from pain. He is ancient yet ageless. He is ticking yet timeless. 
He runs, not hunted, he chases. He is a man of many faces. He is the darkness. I am the light. I may be cracked, but I will never be broken. I wrote that limerick in eighth grade about the intense duality I felt inside every day since fourth grade. Fourth grade, when I heard voices in my head, not that seemingly of my conscience, but never told anybody. How do you tell your parents in fourth grade you hear voices that don't sound like anybody you've ever known or loved, and you don't understand what they're saying, but you know they hate you? You don't. You keep it inside. You lock it in, and you be quiet, and you silence your pain. And I went from fourth grade where those voices were in my head to them disappearing and not coming back until I was 17 and a half years of age. At 17 and a half years of age, I stood on a stage much like this, in front of a crowd just like you, 1,200 person audience at my high school, Archbishop Reardon High School. There was not one seat open. I was perform I was a theater kid. Any theater kids in the building? Come on, theater kids, raise them high. Here we go. That's what I'm talking about. Then you, there you go, clap it from amongst yourselves, just the five of you, that's great. All right, good for you, no, it's wonderful. All right, I was a theater kid. I was in the show How to Succeed in Business without really trying, playing that character they call Gatch. Gatch was a philandering businessman, all right? He, he, he was the, the guy in the office who had a wife at home who was messing around with all the secretaries. He was a total, he was a jerk. And my friend said I played him well and I did not appreciate it. Anyway. So I stood playing Gatch on that stage, stage right, which is my left, right over here, looking out into the 1,200-person audience. It hit me like a Mack truck barreling down the road at 100 miles an hour, my first severe symptom of that disease they would later say I had bipolar, the very same brain disease both my biological parents, Marcia Silvera and Martino Ferales, had before me. May they rest in peace. You see, I'm adopted. My biological mom and dad will get there on that stage. I stood there looking out at 1,200 people, and in a fit of extreme paranoid delusion caused by the onset of my disease, the first severe symptom I would have, I began to believe that 1,200 people were there to do one thing, kill me. Now, let me stop right there. What would you all do on a very audible, loud answer? What would you do if you thought 1,200 people were coming to kill you? Any audible answer will do. Run. Run. That was a resounding run. That's very good. Usually just one person says it, and I'm confused by the rest of you. But anyway, yes. So, so I ran off stage, and I ran to the lobby where I was met with by a man named Mr. John Fennell. John Fennell was the theater director. He was a failed actor turned high school thespian director, all right? He was a terrible actor, but he was one hell of a teacher. He would be the greatest teacher I ever knew until right now. And John Fennell was a character. He had a box haircut with charcoal gray hair from 1987. And he had a mustache from 1962. And somehow it worked for John, somehow it worked very well. And John would sit in the very back row in the last seat in the left-hand corner. Except John was in pain. And every, 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 every show he ever produced that I was in, he sat in that back corner drinking himself into oblivion because he couldn't bear to watch his shows sober. John had substance use disorder, primary alcoholism. And sadly, parents of all of us kids in the plays would bring him his favorite bottle of booze every show. Many parents, many bottles, one show. Nobody knew they were enabling John. And sadly, John would become the first person of seven people in my short 36 years on this planet that I would lose to suicide from pain that I loved. He was like a second father figure to me. He taught me everything about the theater and many things about life. And John sat back there, and I ran off that stage in a fit of extreme paranoid delusion. I ran to the lobby. John sits me down in the theater treasurer's chair, which was very fitting, because at the time, I was the theater treasurer. I had run unopposed, and I won like a champion. <laughs> this side didn't get that. No one ran against me. Focus. 
By the way, this is what my dad used to do to me when he told me to focus. Kevin, focus. Is this helping you? Is, is this, is this, can you, are you focusing now? Are we good? All right, it's my dad. Kevin, 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 focus. Yes, dad, very, just right on. Helps every time. I thought he was karate chopping me. Anyway, and so my, Mr. John Fennell meets me in the lobby. By the way, if you did anything other than what John Fennell told you to do on stage, he took his left thumb. He placed it in the right corner of his mouth. He popped it out, making a loud, echoing, popping sound in the theater. And he would say this, Heinz, that's the sound of your head coming out of your... Anyway, that's what John Fennell would do. <laughs> and so John meets me in the lobby. He sits me down in the theater treasurer's chair, and he says, Heinz, can you please finish the performance? It's not even intermission yet. What are you doing? And I just babbled incoherent nonsense for the next 10 minutes. I couldn't make out three words in a row that made sense without stuttering or stammering. Without, I could not speak. That would last for months because of my brain breaking on that stage. He called my mom, Deborah Joan Hines. Let's talk about her. Debbie Hines is a consummate optimist, the kind of optimism that's annoying. <laughs> Mom, it's not that great of a day. Stop smiling and calm down. <laughs> Debbie Hines, if you can, I come home from school as a seven-year-old. I'm a seven-year-old coming home from school, and, 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 and I, where, a school where I've been picked up turned upside down and placed in a garbage can face first because I didn't look like the other kids. Because I wasn't the same race as them. And I'd come home crying. And this would be Debbie Hines, hand to hip, and she'd do one of these. Oh, honey. And she has hair, so don't worry, this works. <laughs> oh, honey. Oh, well. And you say, no, mom, it's very serious. There are banana peels in the garbage can. Very serious. No, honey. Oh, well. You'd come home from Little League Baseball a few years later. Who played Little League Baseball? Come on, show me your hands, Little League Baseball. All right. So I was the cleanup hitter. You know what that means. That means the bases are loaded. And my job is to take home the grand slam and the win. We lose. Who do they blame? Yes, very abruptly. And they blame me, and I come home crying. And this is Debbie Hines, hand to hip. Oh, honey. Hey, Sarah, Sarah. <laughs> Which, if you don't know, is a Spanish song that means what will be, will be. She would sing every lyric to the entire song every time there was a problem. Thank you for the optimism, Mom. It rubbed off, no joke, all right? That was Debbie Hines, all right? But I'll never forget the look in her eyes the day she picked me up from Phelan Avenue at Reardon High School after my brain broke on that stage. Because I could see within her eyes that she could see within mine the depths of insanity brewing behind them. I can still see her face today from that very moment. Very soon thereafter, she took me to see my first psychiatrist, Dr. J. Kevin Rist. Now I have a feeling she only picked J. Kevin Rist because his name is J. Kevin, and my name is J. Kevin, which is not how you pick a psychiatrist. <laughs> they said Dr. Rist was one of the best in the field in San Francisco. His secretary said that, his apprentice said that, people we didn't know said that about Dr. Rist. The best in the field, as a matter of fact, Dr. J. Kevin Rist would tell me every session himself, Kevin, Kevin, he would always do this, Kevin, Kevin, or Kevin, Kevin. Let's do it one more time for posterity. Kevin, Kevin, I'm one of the best in the field. Yes, doctor, you said that the last 17 times. What a humble man. That was Dr. Rist. He was a character, too. Dr. Rist wore V-neck sweaters every day that were too bright. Buddy, it's not Christmas. Turn it down. He wore khaki pleated pants with the cuffs from 1982. Gentlemen, it is 2018. Flat fronts, please. No cuffs. Okay, get with the program. And Dr. Rist, you know, every session he would also say something else. At the end of the hour, he would say, uh, and Kevin, Kevin, <laughs> see what I'm saying? How does that make you feel? And I wanted to punch him because... 
I just told him for an hour how I was feeling. Were you listening? What notes were you taking? Are you doodling on that pad? What is happening here? And that was Dr. Rist. And Dr. Rist would tell me one day, Kevin, Kevin, see what I'm saying? He said, you have bipolar disorder. I said, yeah, you have bipolar disorder. He said, that is not how it works. I said, OK. <laughs> and Dr. Rist would then put me on 17 pills a day that were toxifying in my brain, making me worse. He didn't factor in my weight, one of the best in the field. Now, this is not indicative to psychiatry in the field of medicine. Psychiatry in the field of medicine has helped save my life for 20 years. But it took me a decade to find the right kind, and that was tough. Dr. Rist, sadly, had his own pain. Dr. Rist had substance use disorder. Methamphetamines the entire time he treated me and his other patients, one of the best in the field. Not indicative to psychiatry in the field of medicine. He was in pain, he needed help, and he wasn't getting it. And Dr. Riss would be the second person I grew to truly care about that I would lose to suicide from pain. Also, another story. From 17 to 19, I was on a rocky road skyrocketing into manic euphoric natural highs caused not by recreational drugs but caused by the misaligning chemistry in my brain. And once you go up, you must come. Yeah. And I'd come crashing down every week on Thursday or Friday after a skyrocket Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday into a deep and dark depression, an abyss, a cloud over my head, raining hail, sleet and snow 24 hours a day, and I felt like I was the only one. Little did I know I was surrounded by a sea of people who loved me, feeling all alone. And that depression, that black dog, hanging around every day trying to take me, began to ruminate in thoughts of suicide. I began to believe that I was useless, that I had no value, and that I was a burden to everybody who loved me. But I was wrong on all three accounts. Nobody wanted me to take my life. Nobody felt I was their burden, but I believed it. I never wanted to die by my hands, these two hands off of that bridge. I believed I had to. And those are two categorically different things, wanting something and believing you have no other option. But, but if we're going to do this story any justice, like any story, we have to stop right here and we have to go back. Let's go back all the way to the very beginning. For you to understand what led me to that bridge, you need to know where I came from. I told you I was adopted. My biological mom and dad had nothing and no one. I was born in squalor in a Sixth Street crack motel in the Tenderloin of San Francisco, the worst neighborhood there then, the worst neighborhood there today. I was born to biological parents who were not on drugs when they birthed me, but they were on drugs after they had me. Hardcore drugs and alcohol. My mom and dad had substance use disorder to the 10th degree. Martino Ferales was half Mexican and half Italian, arguably the best parts of me, and Marcia Silveta was from James Bond Island, Jamaica. And they found each other in the 1970s in San Francisco, and they fell madly in love in the hippie era, and they were certified hippies. They had seen, done, and been, had been through it all, and they had, in my humble opinion, two beautiful baby boys. That was a joke. You can laugh now. <laughs> Not awkwardly, though. Forget about it. All right. They had, in my humble opinion, two beautiful baby boys, me and my brother. My name wasn't always Kevin Hines. That is my adopted, don't be offended here, white name. Anyway, that's my, don't, I told you not to be offended. Calm down. And so my biological name was Giovanni Gabriel Prasad Perales. And somehow, you guys, my brother's name was just Jordash. Mom and dad, what the hell? <laughs> Where is the consistency, mom and dad? And my birth mom and dad had us in squalor. They could not feed us. They had no money. They had no feasible legal income. They did whatever they had to do to pay that motel bill on the hour by the hour. That motel bill, that motel where we laid on a box spring for a mattress over a concrete slab floor that if we had fallen on would have killed us. Next to dangerous metal objects, sharp, sharp drug paraphernalia had we touched could have killed us. 
They left us unattended every day to go do, score, and sell drugs, to do whatever they had to do to pay that motel bill on the hour, by the hour. Until one fateful day, one seedy motel clerk made his most unseedy decision. He heard our screams and our cries in his mind too many times, and he did us the first solid anybody ever would. He called the police. It was the first best day of our lives. And the police come in with child protective services, and they swoop us up claiming we smelled sour and putrid. Mom and dad fed us what they could steal. Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, and sour milk was my diet for the first nine months of my life. That's why my teeth are so brittle. And when they came and took us from our parents, the court documents read about the seizure. The children lie there, barely clothed, not even a diaper, screaming and crying not to be neglected. We had a bruise from the top of our sternum to the bottom of our abdomen from being malnourished and distended bellies filled with liquid. They took us in to Child Protective Services. The idea is that me and my only full-blooded brother would be adopted together. Do you think that's what happened? Not by a long shot. We bounced around from home to home, new mom and dad every couple of weeks or days. No stability, certain neglect. Me and my only full-blooded brother, Jordash, got a vicious strain of bronchitis, and he died. The closest person to me that I smelt, heard, touched, and felt every day gone without a trace had already been taken away from my birth parents, and I developed at nine months of age a severe detachment disorder from reality at nine months of age. And an abandonment issue that follows me until right here when I stand here looking at you. Every time somebody I love dies, I feel like they're leaving me on purpose and I can't shake it no matter how much therapy I do. I bounced around from home to home, but unlike my poor brother, I got lucky. Blessed enough to land in the home of Peter and Deborah Muller. Peter was in the army, and as they often do, had to be restationed. And Debbie was a housewife, and they were a transitional home for foster kids. Many foster kids in their home at the same time. But here's the thing about Debbie and Peter Muller. They were good foster parents. Yes, they exist. They were great foster parents, and they treated their foster children like they were their own. They were the first family that did that for me. And one fateful and beautiful day, a lovely woman named Deborah Joan Hines walked in their door. Don't turn around. This is symbolic. I got you. I see you there, which I saw you. I saw you turn. You were supposed to all turn. Once again, guys, focus. Okay? All right, when you do that in a high school theater audience, or like a high school state, like a, a gymnasium, a thousand kids, when you say it, they go like this. And then what you do as the speaker is you laugh at them and it makes you feel better inside. All right? So thanks for not looking and making me feel better. Thanks a lot. All right, so Debbie Hines walks in the Muller's door and she's looking for not a little boy to take home, not by a long shot. Debbie Hines is looking for a little girl to be the sister of Elizabeth Catherine, the girl she and Patrick Kevin Hines had already taken in. They wanted to give Elizabeth a sister. I look like a sister to you. <laughs> now, to be fair, seven months ago, I said that in an Australian audience in a high school. And this kid in the bleachers, in the middle, in the middle, leans back, points at me, and says, yes. <laughs> so I leaned in, and I said, son, clearly you're confused, and you need glasses. But this is a speech, and we have to move on. You're not giving it. Weirdo. Anyway, that, I, didn't say, I didn't say that part to a high school kid. Come on. And so, moving on. Debbie Hines goes to pick a little girl, six or seven little girls in the house, four or five little boys. One of them's me. And the first thing Debbie sees on the carpeted floor before her when she enters the Muller's house is redheaded, wavy-haired Giovanni. You can't see it now. There's a, there's a patch missing. Anyway, so Debbie... <laughs> Debbie Hines comes to pick me up to see, to see who she's going to take home. And the first thing she sees on the carpeted floor, red-headed, wavy-haired Giovanni with my famous red rubber ducky overalls, which I'm not ashamed of. Young men, you've all had a pair. You just don't remember. And that was the moment she said in her journal of those days, that was the moment she fell in love. And she went back to Pat Hines, and he said, let's do it. Let's take him in because he needs us. And I desperately needed them. 
and Pat and Debbie Hines would wage a custody battle against Marcia and Martino for two years for custody of me, wherein Martino would not show up one day to the court hearing. And I would learn at 12 years of age that he had accosted an undercover police officer outside of the court hearing where my father was searching for drugs and he was killed. I wish I never learned that. All I ever wanted growing up was to one day wake up, search for my biological family, my mom and dad, and, and, and give them a hug, just one. I wanted to tell them I love them no matter what situation we were put in in life and I knew it wasn't their fault that they were in pain. I would never get that chance because my father died when I was 12 and I didn't know it and because when I was 25, I went searching for my birth mother hoping that she was still in this realm and I would learn that she was seven years sober from drugs and alcohol in the later years of her life and then one day, due to peer pressure, she would go back on drugs and she would walk in front of a tow truck. It's unclear if it's to wish it was a suicide. She didn't die that day. She died of a complication to her amputation a year later to the date of the amputation. But I never got the chance to tell my mother I loved her. And I thought that was it. I lost my opportunity to meet my family. And then something happened which gave me a silver lining. At 27, I had gone looking for my birth family. And I found a phone number. And I called that number and I left a message on that phone. A woman I had known in the mental health board told me that I had a sister I didn't know I had, that she had a different father, a, step, a half sister. Her name was Sheka. So I find this number of my grandparents, our grandparents, my birth grandmother's name turned out to be Hope. My birth grandfather's name, Blankhorn Silvera of the Blackthorn family. And I called this number and this is what I said. Hi, Sheikah, it's Kevin. I think, uh, uh, my name used to be Giovanni Gabriel Prasad Fernales. I think I'm your brother. Please call me. Would you call that guy? Would you call that? I wouldn't call him and he's me. So she doesn't call me until two years later when she sees me on 2020 with John Stossel and she calls me because she heard the story. And she calls me and this is what she said on the other end of the phone. I picked up, I had the same phone number. She said, hi, is this Kevin? I said, yes. She said, this is Sheikah. I said, like, Sheikah, my sister? She said, how many Sheikahs do you know? <laughs> I said, Sheikah, wherever you are right now, I have to meet you. She said, hold on, I don't know you. I said, listen, Sheikah, I've been looking for you for my entire life. I just need to meet you once. If you don't like me, if it goes south, you never have to see me again. Please, let me meet you. She said, okay. Starbucks on 14th and Uloa on West Portal Avenue in San Francisco. Be there in half an hour. I got there in 20 minutes. I waited for 10 minutes, pacing in front of Starbucks like a maniac. People were staring at me. That's their problem. <laughs> I was going to meet my sister. And around the corner walks in a red sundress with a scarf like only she can, the uncanny resemblance of my mom. And she opens her arms. And she envelops me within them. And she leans in. And she says, I love you. And it was like my dream came true. What I wanted my whole life had occurred. Silver lining. I would later learn that I had a half-brother I didn't know I had. His name is Samesh, and I'm just so very upset that he's so much handsomer than me. <laughs> it's not fair. Anyway, but back to the story at hand. My biological family couldn't take care of me. I was taken from them. I landed at Peter and Debbie Muller's house, and Pat and Debbie Hines took me in. After a two-year court hearing, they made me their son. I was a Hines, and I was home. And, 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 and growing up in the Hines family was a beautiful thing. Patrick and Deborah Hines could have had natural-born children. They opted not to. They opted to take in three kids from three separate families into one and make a melting pot of a family. We didn't look alike in the 1980s, and people stared at us like we were a circus act. Let me explain. I'm mixed. You can think of me as everything but Russian. <laughs> or, as our president would say, nope, that will offend someone. No. <laughs> if you want to hear that joke, holler at me later. Okay. It's not about his presidency. Calm down. Okay. Anyway, Pat and Debbie Hines make me their son. And they could have had natural born children, but they've taken me mixed, my brother black, my sister white, Pat and Debbie Irish and German, people who stared at us very confused. Women would cross the street when we walked with our mom, Debbie. They would cross the street 
Not to offend, let me be clear, not to offend white women. They'd cross the street and they'd do one of these. They'd do a semicircle around us like some kind of lion pride. <laughs> they'd lean in, they'd stare, and they'd do this. <laughs> they'd lean in closer and they'd do one of these. Excuse me, miss. And my mom would say, yes. And they would say, how did all of that happen? <laughs> and that's when my mom would very quickly and after reply, oh, you know, different fathers. <laughs> Which was epic because it was true. We all had different fathers. And they ran right back across the street. <laughs> we did not care that some people in the 1980s in San Francisco wouldn't allow us to eat together at the restaurants because of what we look like as a family. We went somewhere else, we ate something else. We were a family that was happy. We were a family with unconditional and pure love until we weren't, until at 17 and a half years of age. On that stage, my brain broke and it didn't get better for a decade. Our family fell apart. Pat and Debbie Hines were second grade sweethearts 25 years married, then divorced when I turned 17, when my brain crumbled. And of course, I thought it was my fault. I know it wasn't now. But back then, I couldn't see that. I didn't see it coming. Debbie and Hi Pat Hines, second grade sweethearts. How does that even work, by the way? But here's the thing. Debbie Hines is a consummate optimist, but Patrick Hines is not. He is a pragmatic, pessimistic, and stone-faced man. I see some of you in the theater right now. Patrick Kevin Hines was born to parents with substance use disorder, primary alcoholism. Pat Hines, my dad, had a lack of a childhood. Some of you in this room probably know what that's like. He had parents who were so unwell that every time he came home, every time he came home with Debbie, she would ask him the same question. Patrick, why are there so many frames, picture frames on the wall, on every wall, on every level of the wall? It looks awkward. He would never tell her until one day they got a little older, and Pat would say, Debbie, let me show you something. And he would take his index finger, place it on one corner of one of the frames, tilt it to the other side, behind it, a hole in the drywall the size of Mickey Kurgan's fist. Behind every frame, on every wall, on every level of the wall, where Mickey would go for my father's head and often connect, he was abused by his father with primary alcoholism. You see, it riddled the entire Hines and Ryan family. Patrick's uncle, my great uncle, Kevin Joseph Ryan, would be 30 years drunk and 30 years sober in the last 30 years of his life. I would go to his last 10 chips at AA, where I learned how to tell stories as a kid going to AA. And Kevin Joseph Ryan was of nine children, two stillborn, seven remaining, five of them would die of liver failure, cirrhosis, alcoholism. My father, Patrick, would be an alcoholic until 1972 when he married Debbie. You see, they were second grade sweethearts. I mean, they broke up in seventh grade, but they got back together in eighth. It was okay. <laughs> All right. And Pat and Debbie Hines took three kids and gave them a future. And growing up, I thought, how can anything go sideways from here? How can any of this go wrong? I'm going to grow up. I'm going to get into that great school my dad wants me to get into. It was Stanford. Didn't happen. Not a good GPA. I, I, he, he told me I'd get up. and He wanted me to be an economist. I hate math like a fiery passion. I tell math students in front of their teachers that I don't think it really exists. <laughs> That's right. Ask yourself the question, ladies and gentlemen. Everyone tells us that 4 plus 4 equals... Did, no, we got to give the one everyone tells us, not, hold on. Everyone tells us that four plus four equals? No, okay. <laughs> You're making this joke very difficult. Thank you, though. That's hilarious. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself why? No? None of you, you don't care about numbers? Well, neither do I. I hate math. Anyway. Anyway. I grew up thinking I could do anything and become anything because I was given opportunity. Unlike many people in this country and around the world, I was given a chance because of Pat and Debbie Hines. And I ended up at 17 believing that I was useless, worthless, and had no value. 
And by 19, I had unraveled so much that I began to bear the brunt of depression on my shoulders, and I could not take the weight of it anymore. And I stood and looked in the mirror at the man I began to loathe. Who here deals with inner critical thoughts? You tell yourself bad things about yourself because you've been trained to over years. Inner the inner critical voice comes from every negative thing that has ever been said to us or about us. Do you understand that? Every negative thing that has ever been said to us or about us affects our brains and our brain chemistry. And it stays with us in a pocket memory in the back of our brain. And when we internalize it, we use that narrative against ourselves. It's called the inner critical voice. And every day I would look in the mirror, loathing what I saw as a, as a mere child, 19, 17, 18, 19, and I told myself a horrible inner narrative. Kevin, you're an idiot. Kevin, you're useless. Kevin, you're worthless. They all hate you, Kevin. And then my voice, the voice in my head that I'd heard at fourth grade but never told anybody became audible and understandable. A voice not that of my conscience screaming at me that I was a horrible person and that I had to die by these two hands. I wish I knew back then what I know now, that my thoughts do not have to become my actions. Say it with me, my thoughts. I need to hear you. I'm giving you my all. Please give me yours. My thoughts, my thoughts. Do, not do not have to become, have to become. My, actions. my actions. Now think of it like this, ladies and gentlemen. If all of our thoughts became our actions, how many of you adults in the room would be in jail for road rage right now? Come on, show me those hands. Show me those hands. Don't lie to yourself. Look at me. Show me those hands. Now, if all of your thoughts became your actions, how many of you would be in a world of trouble for a whole host of other things? Yes, every hand should be up. Okay, good. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, if we can recognize in suicidal crisis through self-awareness, if we can recognize in suicidal crisis through self-awareness that our thoughts do not have to own, rule, or define our actions, guess what? We can always stay here. I'm not speaking to you from anything but personal experience. Ladies and gentlemen, I went off that bridge to take my life and I lived, but I live with chronic suicidal thoughts today. They plague me. They'll never kill me. I'll never again attempt to die by these two hands from suicide from pain because I got to see the wake of destruction my actions caused to those I love. I asked my father in the filming of Suicide, The Ripple Effect, if he still feared my death by suicide. And the man who arguably loves me more than anybody else in this world, Pat Hines, looked at me, grabbed his phone in his pocket and said, Kevin, every time the phone rings, he didn't say when I call him. He said when the phone goes off in his pocket since the date, September 25th, 2000, when I went off that bridge, his first and every thought is Kevin alive. My actions did that, and I take responsibility for my actions. I'll never again attempt. What I will do is every time I'm suicidal, every time I have an inclination of suicidal crisis or thought, I'll turn to people who love me, and I will say four simple but effective words. I need help now. And if one person to my left can't give it to me, I'll turn to the person to my right, or I'll turn to you, and what will you do? You'll help me, and what will you do? And what will you do? That's right. You see, when you find yourself in a devastating, lethal, emotional pain, you must speak out. And if you can't, if you can't reach out, then ladies and gentlemen who are not suicidal in this room, in this community here at Edinburgh, we must reach in. We must look to those in potential lethal emotional pain. Anybody we see who we either know, who we love, who we don't know from Adam, we must look at the people we don't even like and give back to them. We must look to the people in pain and say, are you okay? Is something wrong? Can I help you? Those were the only words I wanted to hear the day I found myself on that bridge believing I had to die. And I stood in the very on a very particular light rail, looking out of that bridge onto those waters, crying my tears to the waters below, begging myself to tell someone of my pain. But I couldn't get the words out, which is why when they don't reach out, we need to reach in. Until one woman from my left approached me. 
She had blonde curly hair and those sunglasses you ladies love to wear in the heat that do not fit your face. <laughs> you know who you are. They're in your purse right now. Maybe not, it's a little cold today. Look, I know that Jackie O started it and it looked great, but here's the thing. She also looked just like you do, a giant human bug. <laughs> Something to consider next time you put on those glasses. And she approached me with a smile on her face and I thought, she is going to save me. I don't have to die today. And then she pulled out a digital camera and she said, will you take my picture? And I had to stop and think like, lady, this is terrible timing. <laughs> but I took her picture five times. She posed in front of me where I was going to end my life five times for five minutes. And I used to be angry with this woman. I used to think, why didn't she think or care about me? Why didn't she see my pain or the tears flowing down my face? But then someone pointed something out. Kevin, she did. She was literally the only person to approach you, engage with you, and try to connect with you. She was trying to show you something beautiful. You missed it. I believe that's right. Because had she not come in front of me when she did, what happened next arguably wouldn't have happened and I wouldn't be here. You see, she walked away. I said nobody cares. Was that true? No. Everybody cared. Every member of my family, every one of my friends, my acquaintances would have been there to rip me from that rail to safety because of how much they cared. My brain wasn't allowing me to care. I believed I had to die, but I didn't want to. My brain was trying to kill me as I desperately tried to cling to life. She was trying to reach me. I missed it. But in those five minutes, she had me take her picture. Something in the water got into a position that it did, which ended up saving my life. Let me explain. I I thought she hated me and wanted me gone. She left. I walked back to the traffic railing, heard the voice in my head say, jump now, and I did. I ran forward and I catapulted myself into free fall. And the only thing I wanted to do was reach back, but it was too late. I had an instant regret from my actions and the absolute recognition that I just made the greatest mistake of my life and it was too late. For over 2,000 people, at the Golden Gate Bridge, it's been too late. 98% of those who've attempted there are gone and they cannot speak their truths. They cannot tell their stories. 39 of us survived that fall. Three in the last nine weeks. Five of the 39 survivors get the privilege to stand, walk, and run. They call us the most exclusive survivors club in the world. We're in a book of the same name by Ben Sherwood. Ladies and gentlemen, I fell 220 feet, 25 stories at 75 miles an hour in four seconds. And in those four seconds, the words in my mind were these, what have I just done? I don't want to die. God, please save me. And then I hit the water. Hitting that water from that height at that speed is like hitting a solid brick wall. You stop for less than a second. A vacuum sucks you under 70 feet beneath the water surface. And then unexpectedly, I opened my eyes. I was alive and I was drowning and I didn't want to drown. Kevin, why did you jump into a giant body of water? Irrational thought, illogical thought leads to suicidal crisis, not rational thought. In that water, I frantically swam in any direction I was going down. My ears ring, my eyes bulged. I shot to the surface only using my arms as fast as they would take me. I could not feel my legs. Upon impact, I had shattered my T12, L1, L2 lower vertebrae into shards like glass. They splintered throughout my insides. I was in the most physical pain I've ever experienced, but none of it ever came close to the enemy I battle within. Physical pain never came close to what happened up here. I swam frantically 70 feet in one breath, thinking the entire time I cannot die here. If I die here, no one will ever know I didn't want to. No one will ever know I knew I made a mistake. I broke the surface of the water. I bobbed up and down in the water. And I did the one thing I've had control over since kindergarten. I prayed. I'm not telling you to pray who don't. 
I'm telling you, this is my personal journey. And I prayed, God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake on repeat, and he heard me in the water. As I flailed to stay afloat, something began to circle beneath me, something that wouldn't have been there had that woman not asked me to take her picture. It circled faster and faster beneath me, faster and faster. No longer was I waiting in the water to stay afloat. I'm lying atop it on my back, being kept buoyant by this creature, thinking to myself, this is one hell of a nice shark. I thought it was a shark. I thought it was going to bite my leg off in any minute. I was punching it with my right arm. It wouldn't go away. I'm freaking out. It circles faster and faster. I'm ready for it to bite off a chunk of me, but it doesn't. So I did what anybody else would do in that situation. I named him Herbert. <laughs> Friendly old Herbert, whatever he was. I would later learn on a television program I was on, ABC Primetime Live, with that guy John Quinones. You know that guy that does that show, What Would You Do? I'm on that show with John Quinones. I say on that show, I thought there was a shark beneath me. People wrote into the show from all over the world. One man's letter stuck out above all the rest. His name was Morgan McWard. He was from Las Vegas, Nevada. And this is what his letter said. Kevin, I'm so very glad you're alive. I was standing less than two feet away from you when you jumped. Until this day, Kevin, no one would ever tell me whether you lived or died. It's haunted me until right now watching this show. By the way, Kevin, there was no shark like you mentioned on the show, but there was. I got the wrong shirt on. There was a sea lion. There was a sea lion. And that sea lion kept you afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind you. Now, my new friends, you are my friends, right? Yes. My new friends. That sea lion kept me afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived and saved my life. And it wouldn't have been there had that lady not asked me to take her picture. Everything happens for a reason. The Coast Guard pulled up from behind, dragged me onto a flat board, put a neck brace around my neck, and strapped me in from head to toe. And they started asking questions. Kid, do you know what you just did? Yeah. And they said, why? That horrible, elusive, horrific question we ask ourselves when someone we love dies this way. Why? My argument, you have to stop asking the question, why? It is unanswerable. You don't know what they've been through or what goes on behind closed doors. You don't know what their brains were doing when they died. You don't know. You've got to stop asking the question, why? And we must collectively start asking the question, how? How do we? find a way through the pain of their loss to look to the living and move forward. I don't believe we can move on from any death. I don't believe we can move on from a death of someone we love unconditionally. I believe that's impossible. People tell us too all the time, Jane, it's been two years. John, it's been seven. Let it go. Stop talking about it. Move on. You can't move on from someone you loved unconditionally. That's impossible. Anybody tells you from this day forward that you have to let go of your grief, you tell them, Kevin Hines said to sit down. You get to grieve those you lost, that you loved until the end of time. But you must find a way to look to those who still remain and move forward through the pain to give back to someone who's still here. Ladies and gentlemen, I learned a lot since what I did. I learned that nobody else has to learn the hard way like I did by attempting. What we have to do is be honest about our pain. You see, I silenced my pain when I went off that bridge. I didn't tell anybody about the hallucinations I was having every day. Seeing death himself hover through my window night after night holding his staff and blade in his right bony arm, reaching out his other bony hand, turning it upside down, his eyes lighting the fire in his skulled face as every night he would say, come home with me, Monday through Monday. Did I tell anybody? No. Or how about when I would literally see United States Postal Service workers, the guys with the white trucks and the blue eagles on the side? You know, you know those guys, right? Just this group right here gets mail. None of you get mail. I think that's a bit awkward. You should do something about that. Anyway, every time I saw a U.S. Postal Service truck for a period of my life, I ran in the opposite direction as fast as my legs would take me. And I'm fast. I used to be. 
And I'd run, and I'd run until I ran myself into a violent asthma attack. I'd make my way back home. I'd crawl on hand and knee up the stairs because I could barely breathe. I'd open my closet door and pull out my nebulizer machine. Who knows about those nebulizer machines? God, you all have asthma. Oh, God. So I'd, 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 put, that, I'd put that machine on. You plug it in. You turn it on. It sounds like a broken carburetor. I'd inhale <sighs> the liquid medication for 20 minutes until I could breathe again. But then my father would arrive home, and he would say, Kevin, how was your day? How many of you think I told my father I spent half the day running from the murderous, assassinating killer postman? No, I didn't, because I thought if I told my father that, he would think that I was crazy. I don't use that term lightly. It's too easily and often used for people, places, and things that are not. I say it to make a point. I silence my pain. Don't learn the hard way like I did. When you leave these doors and you go about the rest of your natural and beautiful lives, no matter the pain you're in, never again silence that pain. A pain shared is a pain halved. Your pain matters. Your pain is important. Your pain can do one of two things. It can destroy you, or you can let it build you from the ground up. Your pain is worthy of my time and others. And your pain matters, ladies and gentlemen, because all of you do. When we silence our pain, it bubbles and festers and grows and it bursts in things like rage, aggression, violence, substance use disorders, suicidal thoughts, ideas, or actions. But you know, I told you earlier, we said it together. Our thoughts do not have to become our. We can recognize through suicidal crisis with self-awareness tools that we can always stay here no matter the pain, in spite of the pain, to thrive someday. Now say this with me, and I want you to mean it from the bottom of your hearts. I will, I will never, never die, die by, my by my hands. I will fight the pain, fight the pain. in spite of the pain, spite of the pain. To, thrive to thrive someday. You all deserve to be here until your natural end. In fact, you are all intended to be here until your natural end. Think of it like this. Think of all the children that never make it past the womb. 30% of every first pregnancy ends in miscarriage. My wife and I know that pain. Margaret and I lost Jack Ryan at eight weeks. He lived no more. But I will not spend another day without thinking and wishing that he did and that he's here with me, and, and we celebrate his would-be birthday every year and what he could have been. Jack Ryan was not intended to be here in physical form. You all were for the simple fact that I'm looking into your beautiful eyes. Look into my brown eyes and know you are intended to be here until your natural end. Say it with me. I am, I am intended, intended to be here. Until my, natural end. Until my natural end, suicide, suicide is, never is never the solution, the solution to, my to my problems. It is, it is the, problem. the problem. I will, I will fight, the pain, fight the pain in spite of the pain, of the pain to, thrive to thrive someday. I deserve, I deserve this, life this life until my natural end. Yes, you do. Now, we talked about the inner critical voice. We all have it. How many of you, by a bold and true raise of hands, have ever been hurt by someone you know or love's words or actions? Keep those hands high. With your other hand, if you can, if you're capable, how many of you have ever hurt someone you know or love with your words or actions? Keep those hands high and look into my brown eyes. Look into my eyes. The next question is very important. The answer to this next question I'm going to give you, the answer I want to hear loud and proud after I ask it, is now. The answer is now. When does the hurting of those with our words and actions stop? Now. It has to. By this simple number in this theater, 
There are individuals in this theater who are being damaged every day by those they love's words or actions. Given statistics, we know that some of you are abused and neglected at home, verbally, mentally, emotionally, physically, otherwise. If you are in this theater and you are the one inflicting that pain, stop, take a breath. We're not blaming you. There's no guilt to be had. When you go home today, you have an opportunity to change your lives and those you love. You have an opportunity to recognize the true value and worth of someone you care about. And you have an opportunity to never again hurt those you love with your words or actions. We have an opportunity to be kind, compassionate, loving, caring, empathetic, and good to those we know and love. And those we don't even like. You see... Everybody has emotions and feelings that can be damaged by words and actions, and they define the rest of our lives. In grade school, they picked me up and they put me in a trash can because I wasn't white, or at least all white. They took my ears, pulled them aside, and said, whistle, little N-word, whistle. They broke me. They were part of the trauma that led to the voices in my head. You all have an opportunity to change the chain of damage that is done. You have an opportunity to change and save the lives of those you love that are still here. But it starts with how we treat each other every day of the week, not just some. I went to the Golden Gate Bridge. I believed I had to die, but I was wrong. I jumped off that bridge. I almost died in the hospital of pneumonia, but I got to survive. I went into a 10 and a half hour back surgery where they replaced my back with metal, titanium, the only reason I get to stand before you today. I went from a wheelchair to a walker and a back brace to a back brace and a cane, then right into my first psych ward, because you can't just call them after that. I went to my first psych ward's day of seven and 11 years, seven psych ward's days. The first three were involuntary, forced in against my will. The last four psych ward stays, I walked into those hospital emergency rooms and I said through self-awareness, I need to be here or I won't be here. Ladies and gentlemen, I get to be here. It is a gift and a privilege that I get the, the honor to exist past the day I should have died. I'm grateful today for every millisecond I get on this planet, no matter the pain I'm in. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. I've never suffered a day in my life. I used to talk about suffering all the time. I used to write about it and vlog about it and blog about it. I don't anymore. You know why? Because I learned a valuable lesson this year. In the beginning of this year, actually 70 weeks ago, 70 weeks ago I came down with a skin disease that caused me excruciating physical pain 24 hours a day, seven days a week, feeling like needles were poking from my bones through every part of my skin for 30 weeks. I didn't sleep and I didn't eat. I was so unwell physically. I had second degree burns from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head caused not by fire, but caused by the medication I was taking to mitigate my mental health. It had saved my life for 20 years through suicidal crisis, but then it poisoned my organs. And I, and I developed these burns, and they wouldn't go away. And I was in excruciating pain for 30 weeks, 24 hours a day. Did I buckle? Did I fold? Did I take my life? No, I wanted to. I wanted to. But I realized in the face of such excruciating physical pain that they told me would never stop, that pain is inevitable, everyone's got to deal with it, and suffering is optional. I haven't suffered a day in my life. I've been given the gift of a second chance. I get to be here, and if I get to be here, I'm gonna travel the world 300 plus days a year trying to help at least one person in every audience do the very same. Because you're intended to be here until your natural end. Because you're beautiful just as you are, and because you are 1,000 times greater than the worst thing you've ever done. You just have to realize it. You deserve this life, no matter what you've been through, or what you've put people through. You're a gift to this world, and tonight, you guys, you're a gift to me. 
In my third psych ward stay, everything changed. I had what I call my epiphany and my gift. It came in the form first of my Uncle George and my mom's side. Uncle George is a portly fellow, big belly around this area, and he walks like a broken penguin. <laughs> He's not a penguin enthusiast. He has sciatica in both legs, which causes him great pain. But Uncle George would drive six hours from Arnold, California to San Francisco to see me in every psych ward stay. He would also drive six hours, invite my friends, and make fun of me in front of them for an hour, which is also love. That was Uncle George. On the third psych ward stay, he wasn't laughing. He was angry. He comes in. He sits me down. He says, Kevin, your family can help you until we're blue in the face, but until and when you take 110% responsibility, young man, for the fact that you have this disease and you fight it tooth and nail every day, he said, kid, ain't nothing going to change. He said, you'd be in and out of these places for the rest of your life. Is that what you want? I said, no, Uncle George. He said, well, get it together. He dropped a Time Magazine article he had rolled in his hand on the table like a mic drop, and he left. As he was walking out the door, he passed a 67-year-old Spanish woman named Gloria, who was arguably going to be in there for the rest of her life. There was no getting Gloria back from the brink of her insanity. He said, Kevin, do you want to be like this? I said, no, Uncle George. He said, well, get it together, kid. We're counting on you. And he left. As he was leaving, I yelled out, you're not my favorite uncle anymore. But he was already gone. I picked up that magazine, a Time Magazine 2004 article on how to fight bipolar disorder, depression, and mental illness with routine and regimen. Something none of my first three psychiatrists had thought to tell me was a good idea. So I start to look at this magazine. I read the article through and through twice. I put words into action. I was overweight, near diabetic, 0.9 away. I, I, I go in and I read this article that says that you have to exercise for your brain health if you're physically capable. Some of us are not, and that's unfair, but that's the way it goes. Some of us in this room. And so I look at this magazine. I realize I'm physically capable. I'm lucky enough to be so. I'm going to put my body to work on the ground and get to it like I did as a high school wrestling champion. My body weight against itself. I went to the nurse's station. I said, let me use your gym in the psych ward. They said, son, this is a psych ward. I said every psych ward should have a gym. 23 minutes of rigorous exercise leads to 12 hours of better health. It's in the magazine. <laughs> they repeated, son, this is a psych ward. I said, fine, I'll put my body to the ground because I can and I'll get to work and I'm lucky that I can. So I did that. I lost the weight. I went to a nutritionist. She looked at me and said, Kevin, I've looked at your food log. You're massively overweight. You should probably stop eating tw four meals per one meal a day. I said, that is sound advice. I started eating healthier. I'm losing the weight. In the psych ward, my uncle Kevin Joseph Ryan on my dad's side, my favorite uncle, would bring me book after book on bipolar disorder. The first book, Bipolar for Dummies. I was, they had stick figures and everything. It was amazing. There's one for every mental illness. Get yours. You all have issues. Anyway, and so I read that book through and through. I make it my Bible. He brings me the book, Loving Someone with Bipolar Disorder by Julie A. Fast. I put that book into my life, and I gave that book to my father, Patrick Kevin Hines, who didn't understand mental illness. Pat Hines was always saying to me things like, Kevin, why are you always crying? I would say, Dad, I'm just so sensitive. He would say, well, get uncensitive, and that didn't help Dad. I gave him the book, Loving Someone with Bipolar Disorder. After I got out of the psych ward, he went to the NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness, Family to Family Class on Depression and Mental Illness, and he would change his ways. He would become the best man at my wedding because he learned about me and met me where I was at. He would be the best man at my wedding. There was no other choice. All my friends were pissed. <laughs> I read every article, publication I could on bipolar disorder. I put the tools in it into action. So now I'm exercising every day multiple times a day. I'm eating healthy foods because your gut health is directly related to your brain health. The membranes in your gut are connected to your brain. If you're feeding yourself poorly nutritious foods, you're damaging your brain. Refined sugar is a class three poison. Some of us ingest it every day. I try to ingest it only once a month. I'm not gonna give it up entirely, but I'm not gonna have it every day. I did an elimination diet after my skin disease, and I had done one back in that hospital. And in that third psych ward, I'm eating healthily, I'm educating myself as to my disease, I'm exercising every day, I'm implementing new steps into my life. I was not sleeping, I was an insomniac. I go to the hospital staff, I go to a nurse named Jane, she says, Kevin, I've got you covered, and she brings me a CD player from Walgreens. You guys remember those? Not Walgreens, there are plenty of those, CD players. <laughs> I got a CD player from Walgreens, 
$2.99 and three CDs, Whale, Ocean, Rainforest, Noises, Music Therapy, proven to affect brain waves and brain patterns to affect sleep function. I was sleeping again. Guess who got more mentally stable? That's right. I'm doing everything in my power to balance my brain, mind, and behavioral health, and it's working. I'm getting better every day in that hospital. And I was in there for a long time, two months. None of my family or friends would house me. They needed me to get well on my own. They were done. They were tired, and I don't blame them. I had destroyed my family because of my brain. And here I am in this psych ward, waiting for a halfway home for the mentally ill, living off of Social Security disability on $3 a day in the halfway home. But I'm in that psych ward, and something else happens besides Uncle George. My gift came in the psych ward in the form of a young man who was 19 who rolled in on a gurney. He was catatonic. He couldn't move, and he couldn't talk. Every day, they would sit him at the lunch and breakfast table. They would bring him his food tray. They would take it away full. An hour later, it made me angry. I wanted to help elicit a response from him. I wanted him to get well so he could eat because he was starving. So I sat with him every day. They'd put him in a wheelchair right at the table. I would sit with him every day. I would tell him stories because I'm good at it. I would tell him stories every day, different stories in my life. Finally, one day, two weeks into his stay, this is what he does. I elicit a response. He looks into my eyes and he goes, Jeez, man, you talk too much. <laughs> Leave me alone. And I jumped up and I did this because I can and it's awesome after that 10 and a half hour surgery. People were clapping in the background. And guys, if I'm honest, it was just the woman who was always clapping, but she meant it for me. <laughs> Good Lord, she was just like, <laughs> Just clapping, clapping, clapping. She was wonderful. What support though, you know? Anyway, so the kid finally moves, but he wants nothing to do with me. He hates me, I talk too much, all right? But this kid was special. He was 19 in the psych ward for methamphetamine use and a drug overdose, and that's why he was catatonic. He'd been using drugs since he was 13. And every single day without fail, 15 to 22 people would come to see this young man in the hospital. Spanish, Filipino, American family, and they were thick as thieves. They didn't care if you were a serial murderer. They were like, oh, we love you, dear. We love you so much. You know, go, go, go. Get, your, get better. They were wonderful. They loved the kid. And when he got out of his catatonia, not all of them could get into the hospital during visiting hours. So they would place their hands on the wired glass, and he would place his hand on the other side. It was beautiful. They showed him every day they loved him. Nobody comes to see you in a psych ward. I know seven times around. And one day... I'm feeling myself, and I go to the nurse's station. I go to my case manager, Jen. I say, Jenna, give me a job. And she goes, what now? I said, Jenna, you got me in here doing 10 forms of therapy. Give me five forms of therapy and give me something productive to do. She says, you want to work for the psych ward you're staying in? I said, yes. She said, no, Kevin, that's highly unethical and probably illegal. That's not going to happen. I said, well, Jenna, can I have a hug? She said, what? I said, Jenna, 23-second hugs release oxytocin in the brain that make you feel better, it's in the magazine. <laughs> and she says, get away from me. But then Jenna did me a favor the next day and went on vacation. <laughs> Bye, Jenna, good riddance. And the new case manager came in, and this lady was like my biological parents. She was a certified 1960s San Franciscan. She was a hippie, and she definitely saw it all and did everything. And she comes in there with salt and pepper hair out to here, a lay of flowers around her neck that she picked from her garden every morning, a lay of a flower in her right ear, and she had tie-dye shirts on every day that she claimed were different. It was the same damn shirt. <laughs> yes. And I go to her and I say, give me a job. And she looks at me, she goes, you want to volunteer for the psych ward? I said, yes. She said, that sounds like a lovely idea. What can we have you do? And she goes back. They should have never left this lady alone at the nurse's psych ward station. She grabs a giant green binder amongst 22 other giant green binders. She steps forward and she says, while no one else is there, I know you can file these. I said, what, what are they? And she said, oh, you know, patient binders. Have you ever heard of HIPAA privacy laws? You can't do that, that is highly illegal. HIPAA privacy laws, that's just a, such a serious thing, you gotta say it like that with like verbal, HIPAA privacy laws, you know. You, you can't break those. It's a to and she says, just do it alphabetically and don't look at the details. 
So I did it alphabetically, and you know me by now, I did not look at most of the details. I did not do that. So I finished that job, she gives me my next job. Clean out the giveaway clothes closet. When you leave the hospital, you got something to wear. All right, I go in the clean out giveaway clothes closet. I box, bin, label, and put away everything. And I realized something very quickly. All the men's stuff fits me. So I do what anybody would do. I come out of the closet. You heard me. With a Ralph Lauren double-breasted polo suit and a 70s yellow flared collar like some kind of gangster who owned the place. And I walk up to the nurse's station. I grab a notebook, a clipboard, and a pen, and I get to work as the official documentee of the hospital. Leonardo the Ninja Turtle is looking solid. And that's when it happens. In walks pragmatic, pessimistic, stone-faced Pat Hines. And he was looking extra crispy. And he was... <laughs> He's also wearing a suit, but he's, he's a businessman for 45 years. I'm a total fraud. And he goes up to the nurse's station. He has no peripheral vision. He can't see me all the way over there. And he says to this lady, excuse me, I'd like to see my son Kevin, please. Very proper. And she goes, mm-hmm. <laughs> and points at me. And my dad looks at me and does a double take. And then he says one of his favorite mantras, Kevin, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and I'm over here, I'm like, Dad. I work here now. And he's over here and he goes, what? Like Little John the Rapper. Like if you don't know who Little John the Rapper is, go to Google right now. L-I-L apostrophe J-O-N. Watch that guy say what once. My dad did it twice. What? And he looks at this lady and he goes, get me the manager. And this lady looks at him, hand to hip, and she goes, sir, this is not a hotel. Get me the head nurse now. And she looks at him and guess who the head nurse was? It was her and she was tougher than he was. They're fighting tooth and nail and that's it. I'm over here feeling myself in my suit and I go, that's it. No more Pat Hines. I did not think security guards would forcibly remove my father. They did, they forcibly removed my father, which you don't do, he's a third degree black belt in judo. He could dismantle us all with his pinky toe. <laughs> he went quietly not to make a larger scene. So my dad's pissed, all right? Don't worry about it. We laugh about it today. And just to be clear, when I say we, I laugh about it when he stares at me angrily. <laughs> but we're, we're making progress. So, so my dad's pissed. He goes home. The next day, I go to the nurse's station. I'm wearing my really nice pink polo shirt, khaki cargo shorts, sandals from the giveaway clothes closet right out the box, brand new, that fit me. Everybody else in the hospital's wearing hospital gowns, hospital pants, and hospital slippers with grips on the bottom. But I look like I work there. And I stand there at the, at the, at the, at the, uh, at the nurse's station, and I take the PA system announcing uh, microphone, which is this giant like, like boxing ring microphone, and I give myself my next job the afternoon visiting hour announcer. And so I'm rhyming the afternoon visiting hour announcer because it's more efficient. And I get a tap on my left shoulder, I turn around, and there she was. Her name was Margaret, her eyes were almond brown, sexy and cool, and I was done. I never knew anything more in my entire life, but I knew I was gonna marry her. I quickly said to myself, Kevin, whatever you do, do not tell her that. That would be awkward. And she says to me in front of the entire staff, excuse me, do you work here? She has sass. And I took Leonardo and I put him to my chest because I didn't want her to see I wasn't real. And I, and I go, uh, as a, uh, a matter of fact, miss, um, uh, I'm a volunteer. And none of the nurse's staff said anything because they know I worked too hard. And I went and, I, I, and she said, I'm looking for my cousin his name is, it was that kid. This was her first time seeing him. She'd been at work the whole time he was there. So I, I say, Madam, right this way. Do you know anybody that says Madam? <laughs> I do, it's me. So I put my hand on the small of her back and her elbow, because that's what my dad used to do to people. And I went like this and I glided her there. <laughs> Which she later told me was just plain creepy with a capital K. But I get her to the room and the kid sees me, he hates me, I talk too much. I duck out into the hallway, this is what I hear her say. Your nursing staff is so nice. 
And that's when he says at the top of his lungs, that guy, that guy is a nutball. That guy jumps off bridges. Don't talk to that guy. And I ran in there and I said, excuse me, it was one. It was one bridge, plural. <laughs> that's ridiculous. And she comes out of there like a bat out of hell and goes, why'd you lie to me? I said, Margaret, I didn't lie to you. I am a volunteer at this hospital. I just happen to also live here. <laughs> anyway, the kid's about to get out of the hospital. Margaret comes in one more time. I stop her short at the door. I say, Margaret, when I get out of here, could I take you to coffee? And she looked at me, and she leaned in, and she smiled. And by smiled, I mean her face twitched. And she leans in and she goes, oh, honey, hell no. <laughs> but I am a persistent man. And persistence is the key with love, mental health, and psych wards. So I get out of that psych ward. I go to my halfway home for the mentally ill, all right? Living off of $3 a day. They took the rest of your money from Social Security. That meant I could get a Noah's bagel or half of one if Pete at Noah's was nice to me. Or I could get a Tully's coffee. That was my life for three months. But in the first 30 days, they were a probationary period. You have to go 30 days with following the rules to a T or they'll kick you out so fast your head will spin. So I follow the rules. I'm doing the program. I'm getting better and that's in that halfway home. On the 30th day, who do you think I called? Margaret. You're damn right I called Margaret. I had stolen her number from her cousin's phone. I worked there. Right out of the cubby hole. We didn't have those special like hand print, you know, magnifiers, or they didn't tell you. I don't know technology. Anyway, I just I found the number and I took it. And I call Margaret on my first weekend off. It's a Friday. I said, Margaret, I called her Margaret, it's Kevin. She goes, uh, Kevin? I said, Kevin Hines. She goes, um, I don't. From the psych ward? <laughs> Hi, Kevin, how are you? Um, Kevin, how did you get this number? You know, Margaret, that's unimportant. Anyway, um, Margaret, I'd like to take you to dinner. It's Friday. And she goes, oh, Kevin, I don't, I don't think that, and you know, I just think she was so thrilled she couldn't find the words, you know? And so I said, Margaret, listen, I need this. I need one date. I need one date, and if it goes south, I'll, you never have to see me again. And she goes, uh, okay. Just so excited, so thrilled. I get to her apartment, but ladies, ladies, you'll understand I made a mistake. I showed up to Margaret's apartment with a giant ski duffel bag of lots of my things. Don't judge yet. <laughs> and that's when she said, Kevin, what is that? I said, Margaret, it is a funny story. It's hilarious. When you leave the halfway home on a Friday, it's Friday, and you go out past 9 p.m., you made reservations at 9. Here's the thing, you kind of can't go back to the halfway home until Monday. <laughs> and she yells out, oh, hell no. I said, Margaret, I'll take this bag, I'll lay on, it is a pillow across the street on those stairs, I'll use, I'll go to sleep on it after dinner, but we have to go on this date, I came all this way. And she goes, oh God, fine. We go to the restaurant in Little Italy, what is now known as North Beach in San Francisco. You don't order at this restaurant. It's called Cafe Sport. You don't order there, all right? They look at, it's an old mob hangout. They look at you, they judge you, and they order for you. You best not have allergies. I have a lot of allergies. <laughs> so they order Margaret an eggplant Parmesan dish that fit on the table. It was great. It was quaint. It was clean. But this guy didn't like me at all. He puts on my side of the table a giant bed of spaghetti, a mountain of marinara sauce, a huge uncracked lobster, never cracked a lobster in my life, a votive with a candle, a plate, and boiling butter, an oddly cut lemon wedge like on purpose. And I'm wearing my only good white shirt that I bought at Old Navy on sale on the clearance rack for $5. I live off of $3 a day. That's a two-day shirt. And I'm freaking out thinking I'm going to look like a slob at this dinner, and it wasn't wrong. So I go and I take the cracker, I say my positive affirmations, Kevin, you can do this. Kevin, I believe in you, Kevin, go. And I go and I put the cracker on the tail, crack, marinara sauce, all over my only good white shirt. It wasn't like a drop you could get out with water, it was like Captain America's shield on a shirt. And I'm freaking out because she thinks I'm a slob in the first five minutes of getting our food, and then my brain reacts. Kevin, do something classy now. 
What does that mean, Kevin? I don't know. Figure it out, man. Oh, my God. So I go and I grab the lemon wedge. I pick it up, and then I look into Margaret's eyes, those beautiful, calm, sexy, cool eyes, and I start to shake. I look at my hand. I look at Margaret. I look at the lobster, and I go like that. Oh, I missed my plate by a mile. I squoze that lemon harder than a lemon has ever been squozen. <laughs> what are you laughing about? Squozen is in the dictionary. Don't look it up now. <laughs> Don't look it up now. It's a real word. And I squozed that lemon, and I watched a stream of lemon juice, not a drop. It was like a fire hose that kept going directly into Margaret's left eye. <laughs> Mascara is running on her face. She looks like the band Kiss of the film The Crow. And that's when this lady next to us decides to get involved. Miss, are you OK? <laughs> lady, it's a date. It's going south. You're not helping. And then my brain did it again. Kevin, do something classier now. It didn't work the first time, man. Figure it out, buddy. So I take my hand, and I go for the plate of boiling butter. Yes, it gets much worse. I tip the plate of boiling butter. I watch two droplets of boiling butter fly across that table between her blouse onto her chest, and they burn her. She screams bloody murder. The entire restaurant stops cold. But I am a gentleman. I grab my napkin, and I reach over. <laughs> Doing this on a first date. Margaret looks down and says, what are you doing? And I realized what I was doing. I was like, I don't know. I have no idea what I'm doing. And she's the only two words in the first date you never want to hear in the first 10 minutes when you have not eaten your food. Check, please. It's over. We're not going to get married. We're not going to have the six kids I imagined. Three girls, three boys, Catholic names. We're not going to have the dog named Max. He was a Sharpay. He looked just like Dad. All those wrinkles. We walk back to the apartment. She walks a mile in front of me like, I don't know that guy. We get to the apartment. She sees the bag. She turns around and she says, Kevin, we're going to the roof. I, I said, are you, are you going to throw me off? <laughs> she said, no, Kevin, get in the elevator. 1920s rickety old elevator. We go to the roof. Two yoga mats and a garden. We lay down. I said, Margaret, what are we doing here? After an awkward silence, she looked at me and she says, Kevin, if all we do right now is stare at that full moon, ain't nothing else can go wrong. <laughs> Champion of dating. <laughs> Champion of dating. Yes, yes. And you guys, I waited a long time to tell Margaret how I felt about her. I waited all the way until we were in the car on our way to go see Most Deaf in Concert. He didn't show up. Anyway, on our way to go see Most Deaf in Concert to tell Margaret what I had been wanting to tell her since the moment I looked into her eyes. She's driving at 10 and 2. I turned to Margaret. I said, Margaret, I, I have to tell you something. It's very important. I can't hold it. Kev yes, Kevin, what, what's going on? What's wrong? No, nothing's wrong. It's just I, I have to tell you this. It's on my mind. Yes, Kevin, what? I said, Margaret, Margaret, I, I love you on our second date. <laughs> Ladies, you understand. And Margaret's at 10 and 2, and she goes like this. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, thank you. Nonetheless, ladies and gentlemen, Margaret and I just spent our anniversary. October 22nd was the day I asked her out. And we have been together for 14 years and married for 12. She is the love of my life and my very best friend. And every single time I am suicidal, I turn to Margaret and I say, I need help now. Because I'm not afraid to be vulnerable in front of anybody. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Don't learn the hard way like I did. Tell your truth. A pain shared is a pain halved. Margaret has saved my life on more times than I can count on all my appendages. She is the greatest gift I've ever been given. But I don't tell you this story to brag about my love life. I tell you it so you can see that just because you're in a world of pain today, it doesn't mean you don't get to have that gorgeous tomorrow. But you got to be here to get there in the first place. Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday is history. 
Tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That is why we call it the present. And if y'all don't believe me, ask your kids, because Master Ugwe from Kung Fu Panda said that. <laughs> and talking turtles always know what's up. <laughs> Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is our gift. Let us always and forever cherish this day and every waking moment of this gorgeous gift we all get to call life from the bottom of my heart and the depths of my soul. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Now wait, my new friends, stay standing. Stay stay. If you're physically capable, stay standing. If you're not, be with us in this moment. It's still important. Ladies and gentlemen, right now is the most crucial moment for today. This is the most important part of this event right now. I need you. If you have a mobile device in your pockets, to take it out right now. If you have a mobile device in your pocket, take it out right now. This is no joke. This is the most important part of tonight. I want you to, first of all, take a picture of this. Take a picture of this. These are my resources. I am available to all of you if you need me. Take a picture of that. All right? That's for you. Now, what we're going to do right now is for all the people in this world. Let's see if we can go live on this bad boy. Hold on. All right, here we go. All right, we are going to go right now. We are going to go to all the people in that kind of pain. Let's see. Come on, connection. Connect. Come on, connection. Don't make me ask you twice. You're not connecting. All right, guys, go to your video camera. Don't go live. Go to your video camera and press record right now, right now. What we're going to do right now, ladies and gentlemen, is for all the people. This is for all the people in that kind of pain in this room right now. This is for all of you who are hurting inside. All of you who have contemplated suicide, all of you who have attempted, all of you who may be thinking about it right now, here or at home, right now, we are going to yell at the tops of our lungs like their lives depend on it. Be here tomorrow like their lives depend on it. Loud and proud to the ceiling so you don't pierce your drums. One, on three, be here tomorrow. Loud and proud. One, two, three. All right, that was good, but we need to be louder and prouder like their lives depend on it, because some of them do. Be here tomorrow on three, louder and prouder. One, two, three. Be here tomorrow. Now that was wonderful, but now we need to be louder than the U.S. Marines and the Army soldiers. There were 4,000 of them, louder than them. Be here tomorrow on three. One, two, three. Be Ladies and gentlemen, family and friends, be here tomorrow and every single day after that. You are meant for this world. You are intended into your natural end. You are beautiful just as you are. You are 1,000 times greater than the worst thing you've ever done. My new friends, you are my friends, right? Yeah. Thank you for listening. I will be here at the meet and greet outside by my table. The shirts there are for sale for you. They have positive affirmations on them because it know, we know it retrains the brain. And those shirt sales go to show the film Suicide, the Ripple Effect, to communities that otherwise wouldn't get to see it. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs>